Hello, new prospect. Welcome to RTD 2021 for December the 29th, 2021. Hope you're doing well today. Uh, so our text for today is we get three days out from the end of RTB 2021. It's kind of crazy. Uh, we have 2 Chronicles 34, uh, Revelation 20, uh, three more chapters in Revelation, Malachi 2, three more chapters in Malachi, and then finally John 19. So let me start with Revelation uh, 20. Uh, so back in the, I think it's probably in the summer when I talked about this, I, I probably mentioned at the time, I can't remember what exactly what I said, uh, but I probably mentioned at the time, this is one of the more controversial texts that we find in the entirety of the Bible. Uh, scholars love to debate this, and one of the reasons why scholars like to debate it is because, um, well, for several reasons, but it's not all that clear, uh, and of course, Revelation being an apocalyptic genre is not all that clear all the time, so it's a lot of different interpretations on it, and uh, and yet some have taken this, uh, what we find here in Revelation 20, and constructed an entire theology based on it. Uh, so um, what this text talks about, well, let me read to you the text, and then we'll kind of chat about it a little bit. Uh, John says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven and holding the keys of the abyss, keys representing power or authority and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, reference back to there to Genesis 3, uh, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Uh, and, and he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they were set, uh, they sat on them, and the judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded and uh, because of their testimony, um, and the rest of the dead did not come to life until after the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection, and blessed are, and holy are the is the one who is not does not has a part in this who has a part in this first resurrection. Over the over these uh, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him a thousand years. Okay, so. Uh, in church history, there have been uh, a lot of different views on what this thousand-year reign of Christ is. This is called the millennial view, uh, and really, it does have an, a, a pretty big effect on how you see the rest of the book of Revelation uh, that we've already come to kind of playing out. Um, and let me just kind of give you again, I, I can't remember if I did this uh, back in, in the summer when we talked about this before, whether I gave you the different views, but there are basically four different three different views. Uh, you can take one of them and kind of divide them in two. Uh, so the first view is a premillennial uh, view. That's probably what most uh, Southern Baptists hold to, uh, although there are increasingly more and more Southern Baptists holding to what we might call an amillennial view. Um, the premillennial view believes that this millennial reign of Christ is something that's in the, that's in the future, and so there's going to be a, um, a future thousand year reign of Christ and that will be that will come after Christ uh, Christ comes again. So um, now uh, there there are a couple of different derivatives of that view. There's the more what we might call dispensational view. That dispensational has a has a lot of other connotations to it and a lot of other things attached to it. Uh, but as it regards to millennial view is something we see for instance in the writings of Tim LaHaye and the Left Behind series and uh, all those things that have become very popular and somewhat problematic, maybe in some ways in which they treat the text. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, that's a viewpoint that's, that's held by a lot of folks. And it's basically that what is known as a premillennial pre-tribulational rapture of the church. And so the, the basic view is that uh, at, um, uh, at, at some point there will be a a uh, rapture of the church, and there'll be seven years of tribulation, and then there'll be a Christ will come again, and there'll be a thousand year reign. That's one view. Uh, there's another premillennial view that's also, um, I think, probably more biblically grounded than, than the other one. Uh, it is something called the historical premillennial view. Uh, it's something held by a number of my professors when I was at seminary. Uh, and that is the historical uh, premillennial view, which basically says that this is a, uh, the, that the return of, of Christ uh, will actually occur after the tribulation. So it's a post, what we call post-trib view, a post-tribulational view. So the, the reign of Christ will still be a thousand years here on earth, uh, but it's after he returns 
to uh, receive his church and the church will will still go through the tribulation uh which fits a lot with what we find in the in the new testament speaks of and no way does the new testament ever say that the church is going to escape tribulation uh it's it's always going to be experiencing persecution so anyway that that's held by a number of, of folks in, in Southern Baptist life today. Actually, one that's that's uh, held by a number of folks in church history, not so much today, although there are still a few that hold to this, is something called the post-millennial view. Um, and the post-millennial view, uh, just to kind of um, briefly summarize it, is, uh, is that the end times, uh, the, this millennium, uh, that um, is something we're actually currently living in that this is, uh, and that some people even see this kind of more of a, 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 an indefinite or symbolic number, uh, but uh, Christians are tasked to, during this time, to extend the kingdom of God, and so it's referring to the rule of Christ through his church uh, here, on, here on earth, and uh, through the preaching of the gospel, and the saving work of Christ, and the, and the Holy Spirit, and in the hearts of individuals, we are, um, we are looking forward to uh, the end of this millennium, whenever that is, uh, when we will um, uh, when we will see the return of Christ. So that's held by that's been held by a number of folks in church history. Uh, and then the final view is uh, one that's gained a lot of popularity in recent years. Uh, something called is uh, amillennialism, or or uh, basically ah uh, meaning no Greek meaning no millennial. <laughs> it's a view that the that um, Christ is presently reigning through the church, and that the thousand years is kind of a metaphorical re reference to the present church age, which will culminate in the return of Christ. So it stands in contrast to, to premillennialism, premillennialism, which states that Christ will return prior to that literal thousand-year reign, and postmillennialism, which states that Christ's return will follow a thousand-year or kind of even symbolic thousand-year golden age ushered in by the church. So that's another uh, another view. Which one is right? <laughs> I'll let you guys decide which one is, is right. Uh, a couple of, of encouragements, though. Number one, uh, don't make this a hill, of, hill to die on. This is not, for me, a first-tier issue like something like the deity of Christ or justification by faith or something like that or the Trinity. Uh, you know, you start denying those things, you start denying the faith. But Christians, good Christians, can disagree on uh, millennial issues because, it's, again, it's only talked about here in these verses. Um, so don't make it a first-tier issue. Uh, and if there are good scholars and Christians disagreeing on something, it's probably not something to make a first-tier issue uh, to make something worth dividing over, for instance. But unfortunately, people have done that in the past. In fact, in my own experience, uh, not myself, I haven't experienced this, but I've had several colleagues who, one who almost lost his job because of his millennial views, didn't agree with the people who were who were over the college at the time. So uh, that's not the right thing to do when it comes to this. Uh, the other thing is to don't forget about what John's overall purpose is, and that is to, uh, to tell us these things, ultimately to encourage us and exhort us uh, as the church to persevere, uh, to uh, live lives with expectant hope. Uh, and that's what these doctrines are given for. They're not given for us to divide, but they're given to unify us around a hope, ultimately, the hope of the return of Christ. And of course, that Christ, that return of Christ is talked about here in the last part of this chapter, uh, the judgment seat of, of God, uh, where we will all one day stand before the judgment seat of God. And of course, uh, how beautiful is it that we stand before that judgment seat of God declared innocent, righteous because of the righteousness of the righteous one, uh, Jesus the Christ, that I talked about a few weeks ago uh, from, um, I think it was on December 19th when I talked about that, uh, the righteous one, uh, Jesus the Christ, and because of his righteousness, we have a righteous standing before God. So that's Revelation 20. Uh, John 19, let's go over there real quick, and again, we've talked about John before, so I won't spend all that much time on it. Uh, but this is speaking of that culminating event in the life of Christ, the crucifixion. Um, and uh, I think it, one of the best things you can always do uh, is just meditate on the beauty of the sacrifice of Christ. Um, you know, we just got done with Christmas, 
and Jesus came on that Christmas day in the form of a baby. Um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but he became flesh and dwelt among us uh, to do one thing, and that is to, um, to reconcile us to God uh, through his uh, saving work on the cross and ultimately through his uh, resurrection to deliver us from uh, that which uh, afflicts all men because of sin, and that is death itself. Um, the other thing that I think to meditate on as you go through John, as you see, um, and it's easy to see in the New American Standard because it's uh, all Old Testament quotations are, are in all caps, but you see quite a bit here, uh, particularly from um, Psalm 22, uh, which is that uh, lament psalm that is prophetic of what Jesus experienced on the cross. And all the, all the uh, gospel writers see that as a, a text that kind of defines and determines um, much of what Christ does. Uh, in his uh, scourging and his mocking uh, and in ultimately in his, his crucifixion. So for instance, in verse 24, uh, there's a quotation from Psalm 22. Um, and let's see, where else? Uh, Psalm, uh, let's see, verse 37, you have, uh, they shall look on him whom they have uh, pierced, which is of course a reference from Zechariah 12 that we looked, about, looked at a couple of days ago. Uh, a prophetic text there. So you see several of these as we go through uh, the uh, crucifixion account. And of course, when we also see one of the final things to pay attention to uh, as you read through these crucifixion narratives is the final words of Jesus. And verse 30, we have one of those final words uh, right before he bows his head in, in death and gave up his spirit. Uh, he says, it is finished. He has accomplished that which God has sent him to do. So, John 19. Let's move over to um, go over to Second Chronicles 34. Uh, so, in Second Chronicles 34, we start on um, uh, a. So, I think I mentioned this the other day. If you had the Hall of Fame of the uh, Jewish kings, the, the best kings, you had Hezekiah, you have David, and you have Josiah. Uh, Josiah was that kind of last. I think I described it when we were talking about the books of Kings, that last thumb in the dam right before it bursts. Uh, he is a king who is probably even better than Josiah or than Hezekiah uh, in that he um, reigns for 31 years, starting at the age of eight. Uh, and yet he leads in some wonderful reforms of, of, of uh, Judah, of the southern kingdom of Judah. And specifically, the, much of the reform, reforms are started by uh, when they start to re refurbish the temple and they find the copy of the Torah. And when they start to read this Torah, we see this, this story. It's also, again, a story told in Second Kings. When we read about this story, we see the effect that the reading of the Torah has on the people and upon Josiah himself. And what it, what it prompts them to do is to realize um, that they're about to experience those covenantal curses that were listed in the, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, they, they, they have lost it, and uh, now that they've recovered it, they see what peril they face. And the peril they face is are these covenant curses that we've talked about before uh, that are going to come upon the, the Jewish people because of their covenant infidelity uh, as a disciplinary measure by God to draw them back into the right covenant relationship. And so what happens in this story is that we have a the account of how uh, ultimately they reaffirm uh, their covenant relationship with, with God. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to me the effect that God's word have, has on his people to draw them into right covenant relationship with him. That's been our prayer really throughout this whole RTB 2021, uh, that this, the, this experience of God's word, reading God's word together as the people of God, as New Prospect Baptist Church, we'll not just be finding out more facts and stuff about God's word, but we'll be conformed into the church, the covenant people that God wants us to be. And this is what, what we see happening in uh, 2 Chronicles 34. That brings us to finally for today, uh, Malachi 2. Uh, speaking of covenant disobedience, you see Malachi uh, uh, challenging the people on their covenant disobedience once again. The first few verses, and again, that's a big theme of Malachi. Remember, he is my messenger, God's messenger sent to his people to, to draw them back to covenant uh, fidelity. And this is right at the end of the Old Testament period. By the way, 
uh, what, what we see in the book of Malachi is the Old Testament period is ending a very similar way that the book of Revelation ends. And I think I mentioned this when we were talking about the book of Revelation in Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, we see that you know the people of God are still kind of uh, going astray. And it's a call, the book of Revelation and the book of Malachi both called God's people back to what they should be doing. And that's being faithful to God in their covenant relationship. Uh, there's some pretty stark warnings here in Malachi too. You have, for instance, um, that he's going to, God's going to rebuke your offspring and will spread refuse over your faces and the refuse of your feasts and they will, and you'll be taken away with it. And so there are these threats uh, that they might even experience another uh, exile because of their disobedience to God. One of the ways in which that disobedience is seen is in the uh, the the disarray and the dissolution of the family units within uh, within the the post exilic community. That uh, things like uh, intermarriage with these foreign uh, foreign women, but also uh, things like uh, the dissolution of marriages themselves, as we see in verse sixteen, where God says, "I hate divorce." This is causing uh, the some disarray within the covenant community because, and we've talked about this before, because in within uh, God's way of doing things and the, his ordering of his covenant community. The, the family is the microcosm of the covenant community itself. And so if we have healthy families, you'll have a healthy covenant community. And, and to bring it into modern day uh, churches, uh, if you have healthy families in a church, you'll have healthy churches. Uh, in the same way, they didn't have healthy families in that covenant community of faith back then. And so God is calling them to, uh, to restore that and to take an active uh, role an interest in restoring uh, healthy covenant relationships in the family on a micro level, so that on a macro level, they will see healthy, a healthy covenant community of faith before God and restored to right covenant relationship with him. So I think that's it. Did Malachi 2, did John 19, Revelation 20, and 2 Chronicles 34. Great. Hope you have a great rest of the day on this day, uh, December 29th, 2021.